in the worm that turned. This is BBC Two in the West, now part two in our series on West Country animators playing God. Somewhere in the dark and nasty regions where nobody goes, stands an ancient castle. Deep within this dank and uninviting place lives Burke. Hello! Overworked servant of the thing upstairs. Burke, feed me! But that's nothing compared to the horrors that lurk beneath the trap door. For there is always something down there. In the dark, waiting to come out. But if you do open the trap door, all you'll find are three amiable chaps called Charlie, Terry and Steve, the presiding geniuses of a Bristol company called CMTB. The partnership goes back to Speedwell Junior School in Bristol, when Charlie Mills, who was good at drawing things, began knocking around with Terry Brain, who was good at making them. The trap door is their most ambitious creation. It's about a chap called Burke, who lives below stairs in a castle with his friend Boney, a philosopher who seems to have mislaid his body along the way. And beneath them, below the trapdoor, is a whole collection of downtrodden monsters who spend their lives giving Burke and Boney a bad time. Stuff it under there like that. Put the body in the right position. And put his foot on. The Tony Hart programmes for children, made by the BBC in Bristol, gave Charlie and Terry, like so many others, the perfect opening to make their first short animation pieces. The two series of Trapdoor, commissioned by Channel 4, allowed them to be disgusting on the grand scale. Right then, let's get to work. Ah, I loves cooking mind. Ah, look at that then. I particularly like all these squiggly wiggly bits. Very tasty. Personally, Buck, I find it all rather revolting. Oh, shut up! And you! Ha! That shut them two up. Oh, hello then. In you go. And a few pickled woodlice heads to taste. I think cooking is boring. We wanted to do a series where we could have a bit of fun and also do a certain amount of experimentation. So by having the trapdoor in it, we could introduce a new character in each episode that moved in a different way. It's open. What is the trapdoor? Mark, <laughs> quickly! Not now, Boney. I got problems. It's all, always kind of been monsters and uh, yeah, kind of creepy things and strange things and things getting squashed and pulled apart and generally know. pretty messy stuff. <laughs> oh, right. If it's a sponge fight he wants, then a sponge fight he gets. Horrible little irritating custom colour. Eat sponge! <laughs> Oh, well done, Rog. Now try this one. Oh, oh, that's attractive. Who wouldn't like to spend their life playing with plastic? Yeah. Oh, Robert. <laughs> the essence of um, of animating in plasticine really is the um, is the flexibility of it. And if I destroy this worm for a moment, just take his eyes out. Right. I mean, once you've got a lump of plasticine nice and warm in your hands, I mean, you can, because you're taking things frame by frame, the actual physical properties of the plasticine as it stands don't actually come into it. 
And if you, you can make it look slug-like by just sort of squashing it slowly, take your two frames, and squash it a little bit more, I mean, you're going to get something really squirming along really nice and slowly. Right then, now where was I? Oh yes, sliced worms and a bit of eyeball jam. Lovely. Oh, I stood on a bug pipe. Hey, Boney, why didn't you tell me about all these bugs then? I could have made some nice bug burgers. <laughs> oh, yuck. Oh, oh, there's a lot of them about, ain't there? I ain't staying round here. Come on, Boney. We better go somewhere that ain't quite so crowded. With the main shots where the bugs were everywhere, and Bert was walking through the middle of them, all we did was pour a load of plasticine all over the set, and you'd take your two frames, wiggle it about, and move Burke, and you'd have two or three actually animated bugs going across the top. But the illusion is that they're all quite well animated, I hope. <laughs> Hello. Now, I wonder if I could use this bug pipe. There. All the other bugs seem to like that noise, which gives me an idea. What we didn't want to do was actually work to a voice that was already recorded, because that would mean we'd be totally rigid as to um, what we could make Burke say and what we could make him do, because it, because of the voice, it would all be, be mapped out. So we decided that, well, 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 we'll work out what we roughly want him to say, and we'll make him say it, I'll show him in a minute, and uh, then um, the, the person who's going to do the voiceovers, in this case, Willie Rushton, could actually fit the voices to the mouth. Now, the, the, way, f the way that we came up with for making Burke speak with his mouths is we, we just cut out little paper mouths. Um, if you can see, you can see that there. It's a little Burke's mouth. I'll get rid of this sponge off in here. And then just lift one mouth off and you can see it, it, the mouth that was there leaves a slight impression in the plasticine so you can see where to put the next one. And then I, I pop the next mouth in on there. And if you break down words into roughly where m mouths are, I mean, like an oo is bound to be a, r a roundish mouth, it's roughly vowels, then you only need <coughs> six or seven different mouths to encompass the expressions. And you just roughly time, time them. You think, well, the word what is probably a, an eight-frame word, and a, the word and is probably a, a six-frame word. And it's, it's really done f very roughly. Um, like that, and then Willie, using his amazing skill, manages to say the lines to fit the, the sink of the mouths. Hello again. He's a big un. <laughs> Haven't seen him before. Lucky I got something handy to bonk him with. Right, you, that's enough of that. Now push off. <laughs> the other thing that was really nice about um, filming that way is it meant that Willie had the opportunity when he saw the pictures for the first time of, of sort of spontaneous reaction to them which I mean there were quite a lot of script changes made actually at the dub because of something funny that Willie had said because I mean, he hadn't seen the film before and he was sort of seeing his character waddling about and he'd, he'd uh, um, just think of, of something that struck him as being funny about the, the scene and, and substitute that for our script which was it was ever so funny to do. I mean, we were in fits most of the time. <laughs> oh, what a flipping mess. I ain't getting on very well with my cooking today. Oh, what are you doing here, then? Oh. Oh. Oh, that's peculiar. I've got a funny colour. I've got a body! God, God, look at me! Why are you hiding from me? It's your old friend, Boney. Oh, I feel wonderful! Back! Back! Look at my body! Oh, 
Everybody does a bit of everything at the Kingswood factory, but many of the models are now made by the most recent arrival here, Steve Box. Well, some of them are the ones over here on the sponge are made out of a substance called mini putt, which is a two-part epoxy. It's like green putty and white putty that you mix together and leave it to set for about half an hour. And other characters, like this one I've just oh, been working on, is, uh, well, they've stolen from my mother's Marvel collection. So. <laughs> As they made their way through the land of do as you're told, more and more of the others began to join in. Look at them all, all getting together for that great game of football. So it was comb your hair with the ball, he was tackled by Hurry Up, who then lost it to stop it, who pitched it again. I said no, put a stop to that, and the ball bounced over to go to bed. But he was far too tired to play football. And then, stop it, caught hold of the ball. Tidy Up thought that was cheating. So he blew his whistle. But stop it didn't take any notice. He was enjoying himself too much. Until all the others decided to get their ball back. Poor old go and play. He still hadn't managed to kick the ball yet, and he'd got those nice shorts. Stop It and Tidy Up, we filmed using cutout animation, which um, is really m much easier to do than sell, because uh, you don't have to make a drawing for every frame. All you, all you need to do is make a cutout of your character, this is Stop It, in paper, I mean, it's just covered with um, sticky, clear film, and then do the same thing for his arms and, and legs, and then you can just reposition arms and legs or or different uh, angles on the legs or arms around the body. You position him, take a frame, move him to his next position. There, take another frame, and away you go. I mean, it, you, the reason, one of the nice things about doing it this way is that you actually, as with models, you're creating the animation underneath the camera, and you don't have to go through a massive amounts of planning and everything. You can get in there, get your character, get your hands on it, and do it. Great. That's, that's a good way to work. <laughs> now, one thing that's handy when you're doing stuff like this is this particular device here, which isn't too expensive, only a few hundred pounds, really. Um, can record single frames directly into its memory, and then we can play them back. Now, that's useful for testing things out before committing them to film. Now, this one we did uh, when we were working out Clean Your Teeth's Walk. If I load that up, you can see what it does. <laughs> Unfortunately, animation is a very expensive process and TV companies might not pay enough to cover the cost of making the programs and that's when you have to resort to merchandise, such as these things. These cuddly toys here. But you also get duvet covers, uh, greetings cards, books, badges, you name it, they make it. And sometimes it seems that it's that the program is just an advert for the toys, but that's not always the case. Sometimes you need the toys to make the programs. This is our next project, which is going back to model animation, much as the trapdoor was, but taking, taking things a bit further. It's called the pudding, and it's an hour and a quarter feature. Uh, we've been developing this project for about, well, it must be about four years now, and basically it concerns these two characters, Hoodgurn and Groyal, who land in a remote country village at Christmas time and find that this thing, the get, is pinching the Christmas presents from the village. And it's their job to make sure he doesn't succeed. All they need now is 800,000 pounds. 
full-length animation features are enormously expensive. <laughs> 